What's going on, guys? It's your girl K Dot. You just tuning into the Ripple Effect? Yeah, I know it's been a minute. 2020, I'm back. Lots to discuss. I've been away for a minute because I've been in school. I've been working on other things. Um, still in the sports realm, but more psychology. What's going on, Tim? Thanks for joining in. We're talking about sports. Just, just for a little bit, but you guys should know this beautiful view in the background that you see is Salmana DR. It is absolutely gorgeous out here. It's breathtaking. As you can see, show you guys. This is a villa that I'm staying in currently. But yeah, like I said, it's been a busy year for me. I've been studying sports psychology. I'm trying to get a little bit deeper into sports on another level. Um, but this weekend has been crazy, guys. Absolutely crazy. The Pats are finally not in the playoffs. As you know, they're not used to playing any wild card games. <laughs> uh, I have to laugh because he's, he's a little upset about it. I don't know how, but he's a Tom Brady fan. But I'm so happy. But I, I feel bad for Drew Brees, though. I feel like he's, he's definitely had a tough break. With that terrible call last year, this year is no better. But that's the beauty of the NFL, right? The whole beauty of the NFL is you never know what's going to happen. You never know what team's going to make it and what team isn't. I mean, the Bills made it all the way to the playoffs. You know, a lot of teams, a lot of emerging teams. I love to see the, the talent that's coming out right now with um, with Deshaun on the Texans. I mean, look at look at look at Cousins. Kirk Cousins, man, the Vikings. I guess he's got tired of everybody shouting him out, you know, and questioning whether he's he's worthy to play at that starting quarterback position. I think he's proven a lot of people wrong. I feel like this is the year of redemption of everybody just, especially quarterback-wise, just proving people wrong. You have Lamar Jackson. I've been talking about, if you guys have been paying attention to my podcast, I mean, I was just – elated by the guy. Like, I was just ecstatic over him. Like, you know, just talking about him nonstop. Everybody wants to say how he's a running back. He's a wide receiver. And at the end of the day, the guy can ball, man. It's something that he can't do. How does he have more rushing yards than a lot of teams? You know, like, everybody's really competing for that Super Bowl. I'm, I'm rooting for him. Lamar Jackson, I'm rooting for you guys. You proved a lot of people wrong. I like that. I like being... I like being right for a change. Because <laughs> I was playing against the Patriots last year, and it didn't work out so well. But it's been so great. As you can see, guys, if you're just tuning in, I'm in Salmana ER. It's, it's gorgeous out here. This is your girl, K-Dot, on Ripple Effect. I'm talking about sports, especially because of that crazy wild card game. I guess I was watching, even though the – Service was sketchy out here. I was tuning in to the best of my ability. And what I was seeing was pretty crazy. Because it's still it's still a shock. But at the end of the day, the Patriots didn't have what it take, what it took. They did it. Not on the offensive end. Not on the offensive end. Sony Michelle, he I don't know what was up with him. I don't know if last year was just a fluke. You know, but they they were severely exposed. They've been exposed all year. But now is the time where it's finally just been put to bed. I mean, it we could have been just looking at the end of an era. Like, that's crazy to think about, how the Patriots have dominated for decades. And we're looking at a playoff game where the Patriots are not, nowhere going to be found. They're going to be watching the game with you and I, just chilling out, watching the game. And with my Giants, too. That's a whole other another story. Not another, another story. I'm so – but – since we're since I brought up the Giants, uh, I'm so glad we got rid of Pat Shermer. Oh my God, his play calling terrible, uh, his use of Saquon Barkley terrible, which I get because maybe you are trying to conserve him. But at the end of the day, man, if you're healthy, I need I need him to come out and ball. I need you to give him the ball and show him what he can do. Because Sterling Shepard, I like him, but I don't. He's not a number one receiver to me. He's not a number one receiver. We need a number. Golden Tate, <laughs> he showed us little flashes of what he can do. I don't know. He may be a little past his prime. 
we we need young talent. I mean, and our defense that's a whole other that's a whole other story. We have no defense, no defense. Right, so do we have a defense on Giants? No, no defense, no offensive line. But... And what also made me mad about the Giants is how they fire Pat Shermer. I believe the same day that the um, Cleveland Browns fired Freddie Kitchens. Why wouldn't you be jumping on coach like now? Why? Jerry Jones is moving very quickly after he got rid. After he graciously got rid of Jason Garrett. Right? T- took his time. But then he still got Mark McCarthy. And if you don't know who Mark McCarthy is, he is a Super Bowl winning coach with Aaron Rodgers. But I guess they just wasn't getting along. The chemistry just wasn't right. You know, McCarthy would be calling one play, and Aaron Rodgers would go in the huddle and be like, yeah, we ain't doing that. <laughs> and just switch it up and just do something else. I, I get it. I can get annoyed after a while, you know, if you're a coach, you know. But that is, but just because those two had it does not mean that he's not still a Super Bowl winning coach and, and capable of doing some great things with a, with a team that needs coaching that needs development that needs to to put a to to put guys around him that that can that you can even call it a team because honestly what we have on the Giants right now you can't even call a team. I don't know what would you call it but it's not a team. Not at all. Not on the offensive side of the ball, not on the defensive side of the ball, and not even on special teams. You know, he, I mean come on. It's 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 been it's been it's been hard to watch. Being a New York fan Period. It's been hard to watch. You know, with with the Knicks, with the Giants, it's like anyway, I digress. But the fact that the Patriots are not in the playoffs, man, like that is truly a shocker. I'm definitely a couple of days late with that. You know, my service wasn't too great when the games were on, but it's it's still a shocker. It's still a shocker. It's mainly. Because a lot of people want to, say, they want to easily call out Tom Brady. You know, they want to say, "Oh, he's done." Don't get me wrong; he is getting up there in age, and he is getting to the point where maybe you might want to question those things. But if you don't have Gronk, if you don't have certain pieces around you, at the end of the day, talent does win. I know Belichick has proven time over and time over again that the system matters more than any single talent. But after a while. You're gonna, you're gonna really need and want that talent, especially if you have an aging quarterback. Like that's just, I mean, I would love to see how far they would have went with Antonio Brown, even though I know he's a nut. But I mean, but from a football standpoint, the boy can ball, right? I mean, there's just no, there's no question about it. The boy can ball. Like, I'm sorry, he's such a head case. But I mean, that's 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 an unfortunate situation that they have there. The defensive thing carrying the Patriots the entire season. After a while, you can only do but so much. If you're on defense, you can only do but so much. What, you want me to score for you too? You know, like, you only... I know Tom must be pissed. Everybody's already calling for him to retire. I don't, I don't think he can retire because he's probably stewing right now. He's probably like a hot ball of fire somewhere in the corner, just tight. Like, he's pissed. He's the type of guy that can't just let that go. He, he He's always has that chip on his shoulder, he always feels the need to improve himself or to prove something to the world. I I don't know. I mean, he's got that mama mentality. What can I tell you? It's like that Kobe Bryant, it's that Michael Jordan, that very elite class where you have to be like, like out of your mind, insane. You have to be. Because at the end of the day, everybody wants to win, sure. But to become so fixated that that's what your whole life is about, just, I mean, he's got six rings. That's not enough. Nah, apparently it's not. <laughs> it's not enough for him. It's not enough because he could have retired after last season. And Edelman out there, oh my God. Like, if anything, who needs to retire is Edelman. That boy just gets beat up, man. He takes way too many hits. He needs to, he needs to go chill out. You know what I mean? Before he has, you know, before he just gets knocked out. You know, just, it's just too much. And you see how much Gronk was severely missed. When you don't have those sure things, you know, Edelman was a sure thing, but he's taking way too many hits, man. There's only, there's only so much he can do. 
And that's why Gronk was like, oh, man, I'm, I'm done. He, he couldn't take it anymore. It was just too much. It was just too much. But congrats to the Seahawks, though. I'm so glad that they won. You know, I guess the Eagles' magic ran out. It, it's, it's so unfortunate what's going on with Wentz. I mean, let's put it. Let's put away the rivalry, you know, with the Cowboys and Eagles. You know, just objectively speaking, Wentz is a great quarterback. He is deadly accurate. I've watched him all season. And the fact that he was able to be healthy most of the season and play and be available, to watch him just get taken out again, it it sucks, honestly. You know, because he, he deserves that shot. You know, when you're that elite, you deserve that shot. You know, it's one thing if you didn't play well and, you know, you just get taken out because, you know, you just didn't play up the snuff. But the boy could, the boy's got talent. You know, he just he can't stay healthy. He just can't stay healthy. I don't know what it is. They got to figure something out. You know. But congrats to the Seahawks, though, man. They've been doing their thing. A lot of people keep talking about um, Russell Wilson. Yes, he was an MVP candidate earlier in the season. He was doing his thing. But you can't count out the defense, what these guys have been doing. They've, they've been riders the whole time. Just with them. You have to think about the, the whole team. Yes, they have Marshawn Lynch, but he hasn't played in, like, what, 14 months? That's a long time, you know, to get athletic. And then the speed of the game, where, where he decided to come in at, it's going so much quicker. So much quicker. Like, miles ahead. It doesn't matter how much working out you do on the side. Nothing is going to prepare you for an actual game. <laughs> you know, because that's on another level. Anyway, I'm going to switch gears up a little bit. The NBA is coming back. What I mean is coming back, I mean, everybody knows that the All-Star break, that's when things really start heating up. Trey Young's been balling out. Luka Doncic. <laughs> Man, this guy's a stud. If he keeps playing the way he is, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love Dirk Nowinski, but if you keep playing the way he is, we're we're gonna we're gonna consider Luka Doncic to be the best. I know that's still very premature because Dirk Nowinski did have twenty years in the league. This is Luka's second year. But Luka's putting up double doubles like it's nothing. The way he's able to make guys better around him. That he just understands the game very well. And it's it's very obvious that this guy has a lot of professional experience. Because as you know, in Europe, these guys are allowed to start, you know, to start balling on a professional level at like nine, you know? I'm exaggerating. It's probably like 14. But but still, I mean, the fact that he was able, he matured at an early age. So he understands what it is to be a professional at a very young age, you know? So he knows how to carry himself. He understands. He's got a realm. He's got a plethora of moves, you know, the way he's able to get to the basket, you know, his floater, the Euro step, the threes from all different ranges, you know, and as a defense, you have to be able to pay attention to a guy like that because you don't know what he's going to do next. You know, he, he can split the defense, kick it out, and you got a guy open for three, you know, especially the way KD is playing, you know, with a guy like Luka, he needed that. He absolutely needed that. Because it doesn't force KP to do everything right away. Because we already know, as Knicks fans, how injury prone he is. You know, and how he left, that's a whole other story. We don't really need to even get into how he left, why he left. Because the honest truth is, we have no idea why. Management has a totally different um, reasoning of why he left in, um, in comparison to KP. Totally different. You know, and they said the truth will come out. Well, yeah, I guess we'll be watching at 30, 30, even 20 years from now to figure that, to answer that question, if we even still care by then. But anyway, to just look at the entire team, I hear Kyle Kuzma might be getting traded. I'm not sure if you guys have been uh, paying attention to that on the Lakers. Now, I wonder what trade that they're planning on making. Some people are saying the Kings. You know, that's interesting. You know, what would be even more interesting, I heard – Carl Anthony Towns is not happy in Minnesota, which is crazy. It's not crazy that he's unhappy there because Wiggins, he just plays the ball whenever he feels like it. They have a team that you can tell is not really going anywhere. Everybody else, especially in the West, is on a fast pace. You know, they're they're hungry to win. But Kat, it's, it's interesting because, you know, the Lakers are always – 
They're always in the mix. They're always in the mix. And I just want to. I just need to know how many people does LeBron need to get get this chip? Because if I see Carl Anthony Towns in a Lakers jersey, I'm gonna be upset. Not because I'm upset. I'm gonna be upset because come on, I thought we were trying to move away from the super teams. I thought we were trying. This is supposed to be the year of the dynamic pool. You know what I mean? Like. That that is that's fun. That's competitive. I love to be able to turn on whatever game, and you have Minnesota versus Chicago, and you're able to see, you, you know, marketing, and you know, just different young players on the come up, competing, not just a team steamrolling over guys. Even though I do respect how Golden State did it, minus minus Kevin Durant, <laughs> because everything else was done through the draft. That I must say, they didn't just start adding all these group of guys. It was through the draft. But at the end of the day, I'm just hoping that there is no more super teams. I hope we have put an end to that. And I believe Adam Silver is trying to come up with another concept on how to alleviate that by coming up with some type of really competitive game where they, where player, where teams can win like a million dollars or something like that to try to make it a little more competitive. So that way teams will either try to flunk their way into a high draft pick or or just be able to just just the way they're able to manipulate things. Because honestly, I still would the NBA still needs is to get rid of East and West. I understand how hard that's gonna be when it comes to timing and scheduling when it comes to the playoffs because you don't wanna have a game, you know, like I'm not gonna say New York is well, you guys we have Brooklyn. But you don't want to have a game in Brooklyn, a playoff game, and then you're pl- and then you're playing somebody all the way, you know, on the West Coast, and you have to be over there one night. Like it can scheduling can get a little crazy. I get it, but I'm the type of person that I do believe winning teams deserve to make the playoffs. It should be the best, the best 16 teams. Period. There should be. I'm tired of seeing on the West like that. You'll see that competition like between like. The, the um what is it like eight through like ten like competing back and forth and every game matters every game matters in April and you watch them compete back and forth and then you're watching guys in the east kind of just slide into the play and it's like what like how are you how are you in the playoffs like how you've had a you've had a crappy season and then you guys just started to turn it up like you can tell around Christmas and then even around the All Star break, then you guys just had a breakout season because you guys were either resting your players or doing, you know, it just stop. <laughs> Best sixteen teams, period, should should play in the playoffs in the full season. That's just the way it should be done. Why do you think we all love football so much? You know, I mean, it, it's other reasons why we love football, but the main reason why we all love it so much is because it's competitive. You have no idea. It's very hard for a team who won the Super Bowl last year to go back, minus the Patriots, but not minus them in this sense because that's actually true. But I'm just saying it's very hard to get back. Look at the Saints, man. Look at the Saints. That has to hurt. Look at the Saints. Man, I would not want to be there. And New Orleans already takes a beating. It's, it's crazy. But we just love it, whales. Sorry, guys, we were a little distracted. They're watching whales. <laughs> yeah, there's whales out here. It's crazy. <laughs> but yeah, we love football because it's competitive, right? Why do you love football? But you mainly like it, you don't know who's going to win. Any given Sunday, right? Yeah, because you have so many games to make up for that you feel like you can take the game off. Like, come on. Like, NBA has load management. Load management. Come on, man. I don't want to hear about load management. I don't want to hear that. I really don't. Is it smart? You know, some people are saying, like, oh, you know, it's smart. They're resting themselves. You get paid for 82 games. Okay? You get paid for 82 games. Don't get me wrong. If you're hurt, please sit. Please have a seat. Put some ice on your knees. But if you are not hurt, you should be out there playing with your team. Because you know what? That guy that doesn't have that most 
$60 million Supermax contract has to play with a sprained ankle, you know, with, with, with some ribs that may be dislocated, broken, hurt, bruised, whatever. They still have to play. They still have to earn that contract. They still have to earn that money. I get it. You feel like you made it. So you, once you get the contract, you can kind of chill. But no, that's that's what I feel why the NFL will always have that edge over the NBA, solely based off of that. You know, and it makes it worse. Because even when you hear about older players and like Kobe Bryant and Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan, when you ask these guys about low management, they just – they just shrug their shoulders and they're like, I'm, you get paid for 82 games. And Michael Jordan's an owner right now. So when he sees guys talking about, oh, they want to rest, you know, look at the guys on the other team, I pay you for 82 games. You don't want me to start prorating that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, do I got to, do teams got to start prorating your contracts in order for you guys to get up? I'm not even asking you to play the same amount of minutes every game because that's probably OD. You know, if you're the type of guy that needs to be paying like 35, 40 minutes, all right, all right. You don't need to do that. But you do need to get your butt up and play, period. It's better for the game. It really is. It's better for the game. I promise you, you would get way more viewers. Not that we're shy of anything. I feel like in, in America, we kind of are. You know, when it comes to China, you know, how many, you know how many people that love the NBA over there? It's crazy. It's crazy how many people love the game over there. It's more than the people that we actually have in America, which is about roughly, like, what, 350 million? There's way more fans over there. That's just how many people there are over there. And not everybody's a fan in America, you know, for whatever reason. I'm a fan, but I'm a fan that wants to see the game get bigger, grow better. And I must say... Um, since, since I mentioned that about how the game has gotten bigger, I must pay tribute to David Stern. I'm very sorry to hear about his passing. RIP to him. He's done so much for the game of basketball, even though some people like Allen Iverson didn't agree with some of his policies, like having the guy suit up during game day and dress appropriately. And honestly, I love him for that. You know, he's, he's done wonders for the game. Because of him, the game is more respected. You know, people don't look like they just came off the street. You know, you want to, you want to be, yeah. It makes more money. You guys are making million, millions of dollars. I'm not saying you have to wear a tie, but you, you guys, because I mean, because of him, look, look at. We have a whole. People are so blown away and so fascinated with what these NBA guys are wearing now. It's become like a red carpet event. You know, like the, the walk to the game, like from the arena, even sometimes the parking lot. From the parking lot to the locker room has become the new red carpet. What is he wearing? Like, it's become crazy. Like, it's become, it's become a thing. It's like, man, like, these guys are fly, man. That that came from somewhere. I mean, I don't know if that's what David Stern had in mind, but it came from somewhere. You know, it forced them to care a little bit about their appearance and how they look and how they carry themselves. You know, and kudos to him, man, because a lot of these guys got a lot of deals from Barney's of New York. You know, they have all these Louis Vuitton and all that, you know, I'm sure all these designers love that as well, because look how much money they're making. You know, it's just great all around. You know, but I must say about the game, yeah, there's a lot of bugs out here, so you're going to see me batting things away. You may see me run away and jump into the pool. Just ignore it. I'll be a little soaked, but I'll be back. You know, these bugs out here are pretty crazy. You know, <laughs> but anyway, um, I can't wait for the NBA to really, really get started. Um, I'll probably be watching the All Star game, maybe, maybe at home or maybe in a bar. I don't know. I just got a new TV, so I might have to watch it <laughs> at home to see what's up. But I'm um, Timothy. Anything else on the on the docket that we need to discuss as far as NBA, NFL, anything in between? Thank you guys for tuning in. You guys are there, but um, if you guys didn't catch it from the top of the show. I am reporting live from Samana DNR. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I almost forgot. Yeah. Um, the Giants are actually talking about signing Jason Garrett. Like, why? Why? I, I mean, I get it. Someone else is trash. Someone else is trash. No, this is not applicable. This is not applicable. This is 
no, 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 no. We don't need that. We don't need that. I'm, I'm aware of what Jason Garrett can do, and I'm aware of what he cannot do. If we're just trying to be eight and eight, sign him up. Let's go. <laughs> but, th- but what's annoying is that we had a Mike McCarthy on the table. Like, he was there. You know, I believe he was wearing a bow on his head and everything. He was gift wrapped. Like, he was already he was there, you know. But I understand that management, they – this is how you can tell when a team's owner is too much involved at a, at a fault. Meaning, you're an owner. <laughs> Business, ain't nobody can tell you anything. You're you're at the you're at the, the top. You're the crib little crib. No doubt. Nobody can tell you anything about business. But you know what? There are football guys out there. And nobody can tell them anything about football. So why not hire one of them? Why? Because they want to be able to, to manipulate. They want to be able to have some type of say. And they know with a Mike McCarthy, they're gonna butt heads. They know that. So that's why they're like, no. Nah. What we're going to do is we're going to hire a puppet, somebody that's going to listen to us. Meaning, if we want something done, we know it'll get done. Whether it'll help games is irrelevant to them. Because apparently they want to run their organization however they want to run their organization. And at the end of the day, it's their team. It's privately owned. It's, uh, it is up to them. It is up to Tisha Mara. But... That sucks when you're a fan because when you're looking at coaches out there that you know that can get the job done or has proven they can get the job done, they've been passed up on. And now we're discussing a coach that started a job with the uh, Cowboys were 8-8 eight and eight and ended their season nine years later, 8-8. Eight eight. No progress. None. Maybe some people might say last year, but it's – I mean, the ultimate goal is to win a Super Bowl. You know, there's only been two teams within a decade that have done that. You know, within that, within the, um, the NFC East. That's been the Eagles and the Giants. You know, so. But what are you going to do, man? As a Giants fan, you just have to hope that we don't get Jason Garrett and we have to see if we can get maybe Josh McDaniels. Um, that coach from Baylor, but I doubt he's going to leave Baylor. Yeah. Uh, I doubt it. Yeah. You know, the NFL is so cutthroat. You know, when you're a college coach, you know, you have a very cushy position. You know, he's, you're making a lot of money. <sighs> we have to see what else is out there now. You know, because McCarthy is no longer at the table because Jerry Jones was smart enough to scoop him up. Wow. The only thing smart I can say about the Jason Garrett move is that – know some of their plays. <laughs> but that's just one team, you know, what about the other, you know, 31? <laughs> we have a, we have a lot of other people to worry about. <laughs> what a mess. <laughs> but at least the playoffs will be really interesting though. I want to hear your Super Bowl picks. Guys, so let me know. Who do you think is going to be in the Super Bowl? You know, the, this weekend is going to be the divisional round game. Mm-hmm. Saturday, Sunday. Yep. Yeah, Saturday and Sunday. Saturday and Sunday just became way more exciting. It's like, who do you guys think? I already know one of my picks. I want to see the Ravens, baby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Lamar Jackson, man, he is just unstoppable. Just like just like and it's and it's not just him. It's it's the defense. They have they have a team. They have a team. The Ravens have a team. You know, when you look at Ingram. I mean, he don't get me wrong. He's the best hype man in the world. Big trust. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be <laughs> San Fran and Ravens. San Francisco, man. They are. The only thing is they just – they haven't proven offensively to be that consistent. I don't know. I don't know. But their defense is – their defense is undeniable. Undeniable. The Niners, kudos to them. But at the end of the day, I'm like, I don't know, man. I don't know. I know defense does win. I know it does, but you gotta put some points up on the board, especially when you got Lamar Jackson. 
You have to be able to put some points up on the board. And then you got who else? Mahomes. Yeah, there's there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of dogs out there, man, in this fight. A lot of other top team. Yeah, you can't forget about Aaron Rodgers, man. You can't forget about Aaron Rodgers. As Stephen A. likes to call him, that bad man. You can't forget about that bad man. He's bad for a reason. You know, it, it's oh man, it's beyond crazy. <laughs> but you guys can look around, see the see the view. That's what some are not being. You freaking are, man. It's gorgeous out here. Well, it's probably 75. It just rained. <laughs> I'm not sure how it is back at home. I heard it was a little cold. <laughs> it's one of the only times I actually hope my flight gets delayed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to the next day. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, guys. You guys are going to have to stay in your villa for another week. Ah. Oh. Really hope that happens. <laughs> Anything else on the sports world going on? Anything that y'all want to talk about? <laughs> Those were just my little, my little spiel on what's going on. One thing I did, yeah, of course, yeah. See, I'm looking at my notifications here, and I see that the Giants requested an interview with Garrett. So. Just so you know that that's on NFL, so that's not even that's not speculation. They're requesting it. It's not even like Jason Garrett's requesting it. Yeah, this is gonna be whew. it's gonna be tough, guys. I'm not gonna lie. Oh, sorry, guys. I just found this out. I'm probably like an hour late, but the Panthers are interviewing oh, Matt Rule from uh, from Baylor. The Panthers might get him. The Panthers might get him. You believe that, man? Yeah, I told you. Some of these, some of these owners just want puppets. They don't want somebody who understands the game of football and who wants to win. Wow, the Giants. Wow. Okay, so this just in. <laughs> The Giants are finalizing a deal to make the Patriots wide receivers coach Joe Judge their next head coach. You heard it here first, maybe yeah. second or third. Yep. Yep. The Patriots wide receiver coach is going to be head coach. We'll see. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. You know, I haven't, I mean, maybe you guys can educate me on that. I, I don't know how many wide receiver coaches, straight to head coaches, went on to be great coaches. I, I don't know. Maybe every, maybe it's been a lot. I don't know. I don't think there's been that many. You know, but I feel like we need another GM, man, Gettleman. He's been a lot, he's been he's had a lot of misses in the draft. You know? Don't say Saquon Barkley, because Saquon Barkley was come on, he was the best player in the draft, still is. <laughs> that is unbelievable. Man, all this oh. all right, I'm a little late on this, but I'm gonna talk about it just so you guys understand and know my opinion on it. When it comes to the NBA and their relations with China. Now, I'm going to probably speak very slow and clearly about this because pe other people have gotten themselves into a lot of trouble. Okay? So, I'm going to attempt. Okay. You have the Rockets GM. We don't need to start going back and forth with names. You guys already know who he is if you follow the NBA pretty well. He sends out a tweet because you understand what's going on in China. You understand their rules and their values and their system is just different. But we do we do business with them anyway. And whoever feels some type of way, you better check a lot of your equipment because it's probably made there. Okay? Before anybody wants to get self-righteous and say, oh, you know, China's this, China's that. Uh, with that being said, you probably have a few things very important near dear to your heart that's made by China. Okay? Just throwing it out there. But anyway, this GM of 
the Houston Rockets decided to send out a tweet. Okay. Um, it's one of those things where it's very, it's a slippery slope. This is why. Now, you guys know Yao Ming. Come on. Played on the Houston Rockets. I mean, he's pretty much like the Chinese ambassador of basketball right now, right? He has a lot of pull. He played with the Houston Rockets, but he retired. But it's because of him and also David, the late David Stern that had that relationship, that, that tight relationship that enabled us to have a relationship with China. To have, that's the reason why we have some of our games out there. It's also the reason why when you see their jerseys, how they have, you know, um, instead of having rockets, you know, they'll have some type of giant, the Chinese language or like they, like they do for Spanish, like they do for different things. You know, that's how they bring the world together and get other people interested in the game. Because maybe one day they may be an athlete out there, a young kid watching, and they may want to join the NBA one day or, be, or just simply be a fan. Cool, right? Now, all of this was this relationship that manifested was because of the Rockets, because of Yao Ming and his relationship with the Rockets and obviously his home, China. Now, this GM decided to tweet out something against the government that may be in favor of what we hold to be true as American citizens our values, our core values when it comes to freedom of speech and when it comes to, you know, being able to protest and that's, and that's like a whole not, I can actually go into a whole nother conversation with the protesting, but we'll, we'll keep it here for right now. So he decided to tweet something that went against the Chinese government, which set shockwaves probably throughout the world because China was ready to shut down the relationship. And even games, exhibition games that they were supposed to have during the summer because of that tweet, because that tweet was, wasn't very nice, <laughs> you know, when it comes to China's business and how, and their dealings with their people. Because at the end of the day, I know as Americans, sometimes we feel the need to step in and speak on behalf of the world all the time, but it just wasn't appropriate, especially not via Twitter, especially if you have your hand out for money. I'm a firm believer that if you're having, if you're going to have your hand out for money, meaning you're pretty much okay with doing business with, even knowing what, what they are and what they, what they stand for, you still chose to do business with them. So you're receiving their money, making a lot of it, by the way, especially a lot of these athletes, I'm talking about millions of dollars, especially the offer of endorsements with these athletes. That's why they go out there in the summer and they do the sneaker deal and all that stuff. Fine. So you have, you, so you, you chose to do trades with them, knowing what they're about. And then when you hear about some controversy or something going on, in their country, you feel the need to tweet about it. You know, like, of, excuse me, of course you offended them. Of course you did. Now, whether you were morally right or wrong, it's to no consequence. Because at the end of the day, this was no different when you decided to strike a deal with them. You decided to still trade and make money, make a lot of money, by the way. And now all of a sudden you have an issue. My thing is, if you want to be so righteous and have an issue, then why make, why make, why make the deal in the first place? Or oh, why choose to be the GM of a team who has that relationship? Everybody knows that even if you were trying to inflict some type of change in the world, that's not the way you go. But tweeting, I promise you, that will never solve anything. <laughs> you know, a tweet is not going to solve the world's issues. That's not going to bring countries together. That's that's not the way you go about it. Especially when you're directly insulting them. You know, that's that's not the way you solve conflicts. You know, especially 